I want to tell you a little bit of a little story about desert islands and pirate treasure and the sexiest nut in the world. Yeah. And that's because when it comes down to it, the entire reason that we get together to do this thing is to celebrate the strange. And I promise this is pretty strange. It starts here. This spectacular thing is a Kunstkabinett. It belonged to King Gustav II of Sweden. It was <laughs> Gustav! Um, it was handmade in Augsburg, Germany, and it was delivered to the king in 1633, pre-stocked with wonders from around the world in its many drawers and niches. In addition to the beautiful inlay work and the concealed wonders, it also had other features. The entire thing spun on a lazy Susan. One of the drawers pulled out to reveal a stepladder so you could climb up and see the things at the top. A different drawer opened out into a table that folded down so that you could take things out and check them out more closely, and that had padded armrests. <laughs> There's a lot going on here, but the thing that I would like to direct your attention to is the top, where we have this whole like seashell, coral, crystal thing going on, and it's topped by one of Europe's greatest treasures from the age of the Wonder Calmer. It was a rare sea coconut held aloft by the sea god Neptune, gilded and topped with like another silver guy because you never have too many silver guys. Um, these sea coconuts were just the absolute pinnacle item for a Wonder Calmer. They were mysterious and rare, and they were found up washed on beaches in India and the Maldives, and no one really knew where they, were, where they actually came from. But that did not stop Europeans from speculating wildly. They thought that perhaps these huge nuts grew on trees in the depths of the ocean. They uh, postulated that they were probably definitely a cure-all antidote for poisons, that they could, you could scrape off bits of the husk in order to cure the pains of childbirth, and that they were probably definitely an aphrodisiac, because, you know, why not? Um, Antonio Pigafetta, who was the, on the Magellan expedition in the mid-1500s, described hearing legends of um, the sea coconut, and he wrote that there was an enormous tree called Kampanganji, which dealt in which dwell certain birds named Garuda, so large that they can take in their claws and carry away flying, a buffalo, or even an elephant. In India, when they washed up, they were made into sacred objects, like this beautiful Sufi begging bowl, which is at the Met in New York City. Back in Europe, they were frequently cut and formed into elaborate drinking and serving vessels, like this one, which is in the shape of the sort of like fancy chicken dragon thing, which is what we all like our wine holders to look like. Um, and this wasn't the only fancy booze holder made from a gigantic weird nut husk, but they were still incredibly rare and one of the most valuable objects that you could have in, in a collection. And one of the most common stories passed around is that jealous of his contemporaries, um, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, who had one of the most famous uh, Kunstkamera of the era, paid an outrageous fortune of 4,000 gold florins to have one of his own. But a later inventory of his Kunstkamera actually says that he had 18 of them. <laughs> uh, so anyone who was anyone in the era of the Wunderkammer had to have their own. Not only were they the largest nut anyone had ever seen, not only were they impossibly rare, not only were they from an enigmatic and mysterious source, these sea coconuts also had a very distinctive shape. They are the sexiest nuts in the world. <laughs> Portuguese maps. It was another century after Gustav's time before the origin of the very sexy nut was finally conclusively found. Um, they were not the, the product of a mysterious sea plant. They were, f uh, excuse me, from landbound trees that, as best I can tell, were not inhabited by any giant bird gods. The coco de mer, the sea coconut, comes from the Seychelles Island. They're an archipelago of small islands located about 900 miles off of the east coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. For most of history, the Seychelles were unmapped, uncharted, unknown, and uninhabited. They're, the island clusters 
are roughly, in, there are island clusters shown in roughly the right location in Arab charts that go back to the ninth century. And then it definitely appears in some of the Portuguese maps from the era of exploration, but it seems like they were just noted sort of from a distance as way markings. Um, and no one really spent a lot of time. It wasn't until January of 1609 that anybody set ashore and wrote a, wrote a record of having seen them. And they only stayed for a matter of hours, harvested a bunch of coconuts, took some turtles, and left. It wasn't until 1756 that the French finally laid claim to the Seychelles. They set down this stone of possession, which is still there, um, and started their first permanent settlement in 1770. During this brief reign of the French, the islands became a pirate paradise with uh, French corsairs using it as a waypoint between the coast of Africa and India and the southern shores of the Arabian Peninsula. And to this day, there are active dig and dive sites seeking for pretty well-documented pirate treasure. So it's one of the few sort of well-credited uh, pirate locations in the world. In 1794, during the Napoleonic Wars, um, British warships appeared at the main island of Mahe. And a delegation came ashore and politely suggested that the unarmed settlers might want to continue, uh, consider surrendering immediately, which they did. Um, so there was a period of English and French neutrality for a, for a little while, and then the Seychelles became part of the British um, Commonwealth, and there was not a single shot fired in that transition, and they remained under English rule until 1976. The Seychelles are comprised of 115 islands in the middle of nowhere. They are mostly small, uninhabited coral islands. Just picture, postcard, perfect, little tiny desert islands. It's right there, just northeast of Madagascar. Too small to actually appear at this zoom ratio on Google Maps. And the islands are almost impossibly remote. They're about 27 hours from San Francisco, as I discovered last month when I went on my own pilgrimage to Buttnut Island. <laughs> the Seychelles have a completely isolated ecosystem. They're home to an incredible variety of endemic species and other rare species, including a huge diversity of birds, including the Seychelles black parrot, giant Aldabra tortoises, <laughs> crabs large enough to take off toes, a little bit more of them than I am frankly comfortable with, fruit bats, the size of chihuahuas that are totally amazing and no one told me they were there until we got there and they're absolutely spectacular. And the largest nut in the world, the mysterious Coco de Mer. The largest grove of the Coco de Mer tree are grown here in the Valle de Mai on the heart of Pralin Island. It was once private property and there are winding paths now that's kind of like Muir Woods. You can go and take a walk through this canopy of extraordinary trees and it feels utterly primeval. The Coco de Mer is not only the largest nut in the world, it also has the largest leaves in the world. They spread into these huge fan-shaped canopies. The trees grow up to 100 feet in height and they spread their canopy high over the other palms they take between 25 and 50 years to reach sexual maturity, which is important in the story of the button-up. <laughs> the scale of the leaves is really hard to, to get a sense of from these photographs. It just doesn't translate well. They are truly enormous, about 16 feet across. So, for example, this is a very young tree, estimated by counting the leaves, which grow at a rate of about one a year. And so this is about a six-year-old tree, and it is larger than you would expect. Historically, the leaves have been used locally for weaving thatch and blankets. And the fruit of the coco de mer is edible. Um, it's uh, similar in a superficial way to the coconut, but much larger. There's a hard shell encased, uh, encased inside a fibrous um, outer casing. And the inside of the nut has an edible fruit meat that is described as tasting of pineapple with a custard-like consistency. The Coco de Mera trees are gendered. This is a heavily pregnant female tree. Each of those nuts takes about six years to mature and can weigh upwards of 60 pounds. Do not stand beneath this tree. 
The male tree, on the other hand, does not produce nuts at all. Instead, it produces enormous, distinctive flowering catkins, which grow up to five feet in length, and could be observed easily in the treetops, just hanging out like giant tree penises. <laughs> and the catkins are covered in tiny yellow flowers, and they're thought to be pollinated by the little green geckos that we saw frequently hanging out um, up on the flower pods. This is just for scale. You can see one of those catkins and a few of the, a few of the nuts um, on like the size of a folding table. Once the outside world discovered the true origin of the Coco de Namer, a lot of things changed. On the one hand, it was an extraordinary discovery and artists and naturalists from around Europe and especially the British Empire descended on the Seychelles in order to catalog the plants and the animals and to, to paint the amazing, amazing diversity of nature. This is a painting by Marianne North, who is an extraordinary botanical painter from the Victorian period. And this is at Kew Gardens in London. But almost immediately, the value of the actual coco de mer as an object plummeted because starting pretty much as soon as they had laid claim to the island, the French saw an opportunity to get rich quick and they shoved as many of these nuts into their boats as they possibly could and took them and brought them back to Europe and just like promptly tanked the market for, for oddities because you know, once everyone can have the butt nut, you don't really need to have one anymore. In the 1880s, the famous British General Gordon stopped by the Seychelles and he declared the Valley de Mai to be the Garden of Eden and he put forth a theory in a manuscript that he wrote uh, that he thought that the Coco de Mer was the tree of knowledge of good and evil while the breadfruit tree was the tree of life. And although there is that definite feeling of timelessness and like an ancient lost world in the forest, I kind of like the idea that Eve was gonna scramble up a 100-foot tree to pull down a 60-foot nut to gain, to gain that knowledge of good and evil. I think it's possibly a flaw in the theory. So that change in the perception of the Coco de Mer from being a, an incredibly valuable object sought after and having king's ransoms attached to it to being sort of an ordinary plant is maybe a good thing because the Coco de Mer only grows on two islands in the entire world. The forests are threatened by fire, by invasive species, and by the Coco de Mer's stubborn, slow growth. And so today it's recognized as a keystone species and it's actively protected and propagated around the Seychelles on the two islands of Pralin and Curius. Uh, poachers of the Coco de Mer face hefty fines and a two year prison sentence, which has been handed out pretty generously. It's no longer legal to eat the meat of the Coco de Mer or to sell it. And since 1983, the Valle de Mai, the largest grove on Pralin Island has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Export of the coco de mer is tightly controlled and balanced with replanting efforts. For every one that is sold, one is planted. And they're planted both on the islands of the Seychelles and they're exported to botanical gardens around the world. And while most of them have only been successful out in outdoor plantings in parts of the tropical world, there is actually one inside the palm house in Edinburgh that has been growing towards maturity. Um, so they have had some success. Uh, the nuts that are allowed to leave the Seychelles have been hollowed out, so they're no longer fertile. And the numbered hologram stamps, which you can see down here, keep a record of every nut sold on the island with the funds going back to the Valley de Mai and their conservation efforts. Just six of the elaborate, original, bedazzled, mounted nuts from the era of Rudolph and the Osberg cabinet are known to survive in modern collections. And it's my hope by telling you this story about where they come from that you'll want to see them as badly as I do. <laughs> because I think when it comes down to it, the reason that we do this thing, the reason that we spend time turning history into stories, it is about the stories and it is about the community and it's about the pleasures and stress of live theater. <laughs> uh, but ultimately, it's to seek out wonder and to celebrate the strange and through that, expand our knowledge of the wonder-filled world around us. 
And so I'd like to raise my first glass of this last evening of Odslan 2019 with this quote and my invocation from the evening. The possession of knowledge does not kill the sense of wonder and mystery. There is always more mystery. And with that, I'm going to leave you in the hands of this evening's actual speakers. Please join me in giving a big welcome round of applause to tonight's speakers who will be bringing you tales of stuttering singers and time travels, unreasonable appetites and noblesse oblige, intrepid filmmakers and ill-fated expeditions in the name of science. Please welcome Cody Nichols, Casey Selden, Crystal Riley, Arthur Kay, Megan Dahl, and Sahil Bansal for tonight's evening of Oddments. Welcome, you guys. We're going to start the evening off with the story of intrepid filmmakers and lecturers from Odsalon fellow Megan Dahl. Welcome, Megan. I would like 